Hello, uh, this is Dr. Stubblefield. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to go over uh, Jamaica Kincaid's girl. Uh, you will be writing a textual analysis on this reading. It's, uh, it's a good reading to introduce textual analysis because uh, it's short. There's a lot going on in a short space. Uh, you probably would read this. Uh, it's a story, but it's closer to the length of a long poem. And a lot of the ways you read it, uh, I would think, would be like a poem. Uh, the, the grammar and the syntax play a large role. Uh, there's certain, you have to pay very close attention to every little use of language, who's speaking, who's not speaking, um, the tone, the style, the diction. And you can make a lot of analytic or interpretive claims in a very small space and from a teaching standpoint, demonstrate them. So let's go ahead and get started. If you want to watch the video, uh, the author read the story. Um, sometimes I think that adds something to it, helps you get the flavor of it a little bit, and perhaps humanizes it. It may not be a bad idea. So I've provided a link in that uh, slide. A little bit about her biography. She was born in uh, 1949, so she might be the age of your grandparents, or depending on your age, maybe even slightly older, uh, on an island of Antigua, very small island. And what we see portrayed in the story is the, the knowledge that the transmission of a gender role on... Um, this small island of Antigua is a very traditional society. Uh, it's dominated by manual labor. Um, and it's very small, tight-knit, tight norms. It's not a cosmopolitan society with a bunch of competing norms. It's a very tight-knit community with very strict roles. Um, I'm not going to read everything on the PowerPoint. I'll, I'll attach the PowerPoint as well. Uh, you know, nobody probably ever thought she was going to end up writing for the New Yorker. You probably would see a bunch of people carrying baskets, washing clothes, uh, you know, it's very rural type of setting. And it is a remarkable story that she ends up being this writer um, of all her life choices that probably wasn't on the table for her or in the eyes of, of others. And that's precisely what she did. There's a little bit about Antigua. Its uh, population is listed at 85 to 90,000. Many of them came after a hurricane destroyed 90% of Irma. They kind of came to this island. Uh, Hall County, Georgia is about 200,000 to put it in perspective. So it's about half the size of that. Again, it's very tight, very uh, close-knit community, and with very well-defined um, gender roles. It's a lot of manual labor, uh, poverty, um, a very rural, labor-intensive society. There is the legacy of slavery there, which shapes um, many of their values, we would say, uh, perhaps, and some of what perhaps we see in girl might be a legacy of, you know, slavery. The, the fear, for example, of, of stepping out of line and um, the, uh, the emphasis on appearing to be a certain way at, at a certain risk, perhaps, of not uh, appearing that way. She does make the comment that Americans love happy endings. A lot has been written on this. Um, I recently read Brights, Brightsided by Barbara uh, Ironreich, and the whole book was about Americans' optimism and particularly its interest in positive thinking. Um, others have commented. Terry Eagleton wrote a book across the pond where he talks about living in England where they're known for their satirical... Uh, somewhat cynical wit and coming across the pond to America 
And in his words, there was this, you know, irritating compulsory optimism about everything. So we do look that way to other people. And um, her position here is that life is hard. And it's not a, not meant to be a downer. Many people, uh, I don't think it is, uh, advocate the, the tragic side of life because it absolutely puts a responsibility on you to find meaning. And it's not going to be given to you. Life is suffering. But when you do that, then it's necessary, if you're going to find meaning, to find something to suffer for that is worthwhile and perhaps to be able to endure that suffering. So it's not trying to tell people necessarily a, a bad ending to give up. It's that here we are, we're struggling and we have to find meaning and try to, we, we're engaged in a challenge. And it's not, not just going to run like a program where we're all going to end up shiny, happy people holding hands. There's, some, there's something to do if life is, if we're not guaranteed a happy ending. There's something to work for. Um, why does the story begin? The story begins abruptly with words spoken by an unidentified voice. Who is speaking? Why do you think this? Uh, her mother is speaking to a young girl. She's transmitting the historical knowledge of what it means to be uh, a woman. Every society does this to different degrees, whether it's giving somebody a doll or um, dressing uh, a, a girl or, or a boy. We do it with boys as well. It's how society reproduces itself, how tradition is passed along, and we all begin our lives socialized by some sort of uh, traditional norms to various degrees. Who is the speaker speaking to? Why do you think this? She's speaking to her daughter, who is also the author. Uh, what is the voice trying to tell whoever she's speaking? To? I, I pretty much just said that. Who is speaking in lines and italics? The girl does speak. She's notably absent. It's important. Here's again with the sort of poetic reading. She speaks two times. Uh, one is to um, to disagree or to point out her absence in the picture that's being described. She says, I don't even, but I don't even sing in church. Um, it's notable that this interruption happens about in response to something that occurred three or four lines above. So you get the picture that the girl can't even get the word in edgewise. Um, and then finally she speaks again, uh, what if the baker won't let me touch the bread at the end, right? So their second, uh, you know, speech act is to question the narrative. And um, it's interesting there that that question is, well, then it'll be your fault. So we kind of get the idea that um, what looks like maybe socially bad treatment or unfair treatment will be because you did not perform this gender role correctly. So we find out that, I didn't, you know, these gender roles are normative and there are consequences for violating them. And one of them here would be that, you know, you didn't carry yourself the right way. Therefore, you got treated poorly. You can think about this. I think there's a lot of answers. What do you think the main tension is? Uh, one of the things is that, you know, it's the title of the story is Girl. The girl's name is never mentioned. She doesn't appear to have any individuality. This could apply to anybody. It doesn't take into account individual differences, individual talents, individual wants, individual desires. Like any stereotype, all girls are supposed to be the same thing. Um, you know, some of the, when I've talked before, some of them see that this is a type of feminism here. I mean, you could definitely read it that way. I mean, is she talking about She's talking about a particular culture and a particular island, I think. Um, it doesn't seem to beat up men. It seems to be something internal to women. Uh, women seem to be passing it on to to women, which you could still say, you know, it may be a, a patriarchal society in the background that's, that's dictating that um, mothers are transmitting this to women. But some of the um, it, it's, it doesn't appear to be, at least on the surface, the type of uh, man bashing. Right? Um, 
and uh, the tension, you could read it a number of ways. Is it between her? I mean, this girl's going to end up being a writer for the New Yorker. She doesn't seem to appear in the discourse, uh, in the particular gender, gender discourse. That'd be my word for it. Traditional gender discourse, we might say. And she appears to question it. But it appears not to take her individuality in, into account. And, it, and perhaps with there being consequences if she asserts her individuality. There's other answers to that question too. I think that's the most clear and a lot of people really get in the title. She hardly gets to speak, right? And um, there you go. And, and just to get into the grammar and the syntax, it's one sentence. This is important. You know, the form in which something's written, particularly in a poem, will uh, be part of the content. Form is content. What, what do we mean by this? The fact that it takes the form of one long repetitive, like a machine gun, you know, bowling over the girl who's not allowed to speak. It's this unending, never stop to pause, never take a break, just complete monologue, right? Um, that is also, it looks like a formal element, but it's also saying that this is what it means to encounter uh, this particular gender norms. It's also a statement that's being made by, by putting the story in that form, telling you how it's like uh, to be uh, socialized into this type of a role. So it's just, most of the sentences are imperatives. I think almost all do this, do that. They're all commands. There's no question. There's, it's a, there's no dialogue. There's no, it's, there's no stopping. It's a, it's a, just a, this sort of machine that bowls you over with a set of imperatives, a set of commands. So these formal ele elements take on importance. Um, yeah, it's one long sentence. You can't breathe, suffocating. You can't pause, question, think about it, contemplate it. It's just running. Yeah, it's not a two-way relationship. It's not, we'd say, dialogue. There's no dialogue. It's not a dialogical relationship. It's largely a monologue with the exception of two interruptions in italics by the girl. Again, it's not a... The, 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 with any stereotype, it's they're impersonal. It's not... Uh, your, your name. It's, it's all told from, you know, you. And it is, you could be anybody. And it's, some of the themes your your textual analysis will be on can be either on theme or on character. One of them is the transformative power of domesticity. Um, I mean, the, the idea here is that the role is highly domestic, and how perhaps this work to the, the the sort of hangover from the past can work to limit the girl's life possibilities. Um, you know, cook, clean, bake, sew, all of these types of things. Uh, there's also the deal that, it, you know, I think that's in the next slide. But I think, I think that's one thing that steps out is the danger of female sexuality. The word slut appears again and again. The last thing you want to do is to appear to be a slut or an unacceptable woman. Um, some might see a double standard where, you know, men are sometimes at least praised for their sexual conquest, but for a woman, it would be very damaging. The second thing you might see is that general, and in women, reputation is more important. Oftentimes, I, I read a good bit of evolutionary psychology. Uh, the idea is that men tend to resolve conflicts through violence or through sort of a direct one-on-one -on -one confrontation that we evolved a certain way where, where women um you know uh, were less violent right they they tend to express aggression through uh you know slander repu destroying someone's reputation innuendo or gossip is what I said, that's a, that's a stereotype. This is something I thought about. But you see this all-pervasiveness of reputation, 
where and perhaps perhaps men are, are less worried about their social reputation, you know, and, and uh, more worried about you know what they can do, and um, maybe it's a burden they don't have to carry as much. There's a lot of different ways to look at it, um, but we. I think we touched on this with social media. It's one of the reasons why the social media has had uh, negative psychological consequences on women is because the idea is that they're already hardwired for reputation. You know, and boys were more competitive, violent video games. Girls are more, you know, uh, more social media, posting pictures and, um, you know, they get this whole reputation and, sort of, um, this, rep, you know, s- destroying reputations, um, and so forth, that it's been particularly hard on girls. I, I don't see anything inherently better. If anything, you might say violence is worse, you know, boys, uh, but it, it's a longstanding, um, sort of historical, there's historical evidence for it. I mean, obviously that might mean 51%, you know, it's not saying that every girl's reputation except, uh, obsessed. But there's this, this prominence of reputation, and it's very punitive. There's there's a lot of consequences. You you pretty much fail at the end if you're not your reputation is not successful. You you know you want to keep a good reputation above everything, and perhaps this keeps women from you know this this particular gender stereotype on in Antigua would keep women from you know being a trailblazer and maybe going against her society or going against her life plan or so forth. If there's a strong thing that that the most important thing is your reputation and your uh the way to get that is performing this role and um sexuality playing a very big big role in all of this and there is a you know it's about gender it could be about you could read it as about stereotypes and gender in, in, in general you know this is what i see as a stereotype is how i see it you know working to limit somebody's life possibilities but then again, you know, it, it is about a specific girl and it, it does the, the setting and the context is uh, about the transmission of the particularly uh, female gender role. And you could look at, you know, some equality. There's, there's a little bit of agency that the person has, or we'd say a little bit of freedom. One of them is you have the freedom to spit in the wind. Uh, that, that's people read this different ways at one time it you know it looks like well gee that's the most useless freedom anybody could have is that that's a satire of freedom um others might say that it's a metaphor for uh you can act against your own self-interest or there's a hint you might um you'd have to develop that idea the other one is that you a man can bully a woman a woman can bully a man it does attribute it's the second spot a certain amount we say of agency or freedom. You know, here's something you're free to do. Everything else has been a command, okay? But there's, you know, everything else has been society telling you what to do and providing the norm for you. But there's just a couple spots in the story where it says, okay, here's something you can do. And um, that power is in the realm of personal relationships. That's one way you can look at this you've got some power in personal relationships and in the realm of domesticity right with your husband uh with your man and so forth and then there would be a question of whether there's any power that would extend beyond that to the public sphere to the political sphere to a career pursuit is the point being made is a question that you know women tend to have if you got power it's in personal relationships it might be with your children or with your husband you can speak up there, have a voice, right? This traditional role. Um, and you can spit in the wind, which you have to interpret what, what that means. So there, there are a whole lot of things you could get out of this. I, I mentioned a few things uh, in the presentation. Um, most students can relate to, uh, you know, having just, if you're a traditional student and you're somewhere 18 to 22, you've just got, just finished, um, you know, being socialized into a, a certain role and you are waiting to go out into society, right? That's, that's the idea. Uh, so perhaps you've thought about this socialization that you've received. 
Um, maybe there's some ways it limits your possibilities. Right? Maybe there's ways that you want to break from it. Maybe there's ways that you want to hold on to it and respond to it. That um, there are many uh, positive traits here. Um, the, or the reading seems to be uh, pointing to you know somewhat critical, if nothing else, the, the formal things. The girl doesn't get to talk except to note her absence. It's irrelevant. It doesn't seem to apply to her. And her first comment, the second one, she questions it, told it's her fault. So, I mean, it clearly, it's, there seems to be a, a, a critique of the sort of lived experience of being a young girl in Antigua, faced with a gender uh, stereotype that, uh, I don't know, we don't think it helped her if become a writer for The New Yorker, and if that was her dream, uh, seemed to be an obstacle. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit about how you do a textual analysis. Uh, we talked about claims, evidence, and analysis. That's the name of the game. There's another video on that. In this video, I just wanted to do a quick run through uh, of a text. I could go more deeply into it, but it's so short. And I think you guys will have something to say, but I put some ideas out on the table.